welcome to the first uh, session on this satellite conference. My name is Heidi Olsen. Uh, I'm a Norwegian and I'm a member of the LTR section of uh, IFLA. I will do my best to contribute to a smooth session. The title of the session is Barriers and Opportunities. Uh, the three presentations will, <clears throat> will contribute from different angles on this uh, subject. We will hear about concrete examples of co-location and co-administration of LAM institutions, theoretical aspects of studying this, challenges concerning management of multifaceted collections, and finally, uh, LAM professionals uh, and their attitudes and role in the digital, digital development. Some practical information before we start. There will be room for some short questions after each presentation. And when, when we have heard all three of them, we hope all of you will contribute in the final discussion. And now we're looking forward to the first presentation. Marco Rubicchi, Lorenzo Verna, and Maria pa Pagano will present their paper, Libraries, Archives, and Museums Between Physical and Digital Space, Models and Analy Analysis Perspectives. Marco Rubicchi is a librarian working as project manager at the heritage agency Prome Promemoria in Turin. Lorenzo, <coughs> sorry, Lorenzo Verna um, holds a master in computer science uh, and is CEO in Tickly, a company working on R&D of cloud-based uh, engine, uh, analysis engines. And Maria pa Pagano uh, is working on her master degree studying different user styles of use and perceptions public in public libraries. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks and good morning. I am very glad to be here. And uh, as we have uh, already heard until now, uh, we can say with uh, And we can say with certainty that we live in a, a very structured and complexity society. And this complexity um, reflected is uh, in, in uh, every sector, perhaps especially in the cultural one. The ways uh, in which uh, uh, cultural memory uh, preserved in museums, archives, and libraries uh, <laughs> are communicated and organized are changing, mainly because of the um, frequent digitalization of information resources. And uh, um, that uh, will the, um, inevitably require our, our um, rethinking of the, um, of the skills that their professionals have to, to, should have to um, make uh, useful services for their, um, for their users, for the, their different kind of users. Uh, the subjective community and um, IFLA, uh, with its contribution of 2008, um, highlight the need for a, um, for a greater collaboration and convergence between, uh, um, between uh, uh, museums, archives, and uh, libraries, libraries digital and also physical space, and uh, call uh, the professionals to find out the new um, and, uh, Propose a new evaluative and interpretative model of analysis of this new type of uh, uh, con convergent uh, uh, space. Um, in line with these uh, uh, with, with these, um, these uh, reflections, the aim of the of the of our contribution is to um, suggest the development of a prospective model based on a, an holistic approach um, that will be um, analyzed the um, different uh, type of convergence uh, spaces in digital and uh, in physical space and uh, uh, observe the relationships between object um, and uh, resources object and users and, uh, and space. 
the, um, with um, these, uh, these reflections and the analysis model will be, um, will, uh, will be um, characterized using the um, quantitative and qualitative analysis method and the principle of the network science. This, uh, this contribution will be developed uh, in three sections that are closely linked to each other. In the first part, by Marco Rubicchi, um, we try to investigate uh, what kind of effort are these institutions, uh, museums, libraries, and archives, um, on a collaborative uh, and a coexistence uh, project in, uh, in web. In the second part, uh, I will try to investigate the phenomena detected in the physical space. Uh, in particular, um, the focus is on, the, on a specific case of study, MAB, Montelupo, Museo, Archivio, and Biblioteca. Um, and uh, I present the, uh, our um, an a prospective analysis model based on this uh, holistic approach. And in the third part, uh, by Lorenzo Verna, uh, we can try to analyze the, um, detected phen the phenomena detected in the digital space using the uh, principle of network uh, science. And now I leave the word to Marco. Thank you, Maria, and good morning to everybody. And uh, my contribution uh, called LAM, the Digital Space Coexistence and Convergence in the web, on the web, and uh, start from an IFLA report, uh, the number 108, uh, where uh, um, the title is uh, Public Library, Archives, and Museum, trends in collaboration and uh, cooperation. Um, in that report, it's clear that uh, library, museums, and archives are uh, often natural partners uh, because uh, usually they serve the same community in a similar way, and uh, supporting and changing lifelong learning opportunities, um, so usually preserving community heritage, that is really important, and protecting and providing access to information. But uh, how you can see, on the other hand, uh, beyond these aims in collaboration and cooperation, uh, in, in that fuel integrated system, there are a set of problems sometimes. And first of all, um, non-common professional practices and, uh, or non-common access system, and uh, sometimes cultural heritage have distinct identity and uh, uh, distinguishing futures. So, um, at this point, there are two main questions. The first one is, uh, uh, what kind of effort could these institutions uh, um, making in terms of uh, collaboration and coexistence uh, about integrated project on the web? Uh, one important point is uh, that, um, for sure, the collaboration to increasing online access uh, to resources. One of most important is the well-developed metadata that, is, that result essential and the strong relationship among different professionals. Uh, the second question uh, is related to the, um, the users. So what is the relationship between uh, the user ability and, that of, uh, and the effort made by the, the LAM institution in connection with their integrated project on, uh, on the web. Um, you can see two quotes, and the first one is of David Ferriero, former director of the New, Public, New York Public Library, uh, where uh, he said that the challenge, um, the main challenge for librarians, archivists, and museum curators today uh, is to work across uh, uh, in, um, to deliver the integrated, uh, the teach save user um, because the users are increasing coming to, es to expect. Uh, the second quote uh, and the second point is that the new user um, uh, want to have the ability uh, to use the resources of cultural institutions uh, in the same way they do with other resources on, on the web. So uh, at this point, the, the, the direction seems to be the right one because uh, both uh, professionals and users are exploring uh, the need to find a meeting point, um, both in the digital space and uh, in the physical space. 
Um, so I want to show you three simple examples about uh, uh, web experience of convergence. The first one is the new school that is an interface about uh, uh, the, the University of New York and the new school is uh, this interface where there is the connection for libraries and a university in the USA. And uh, you can see that the interface is uh, visually attractive, uh, both virtually and electronically. And you can see that uh, it's easy to understand uh, all the, 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 the where are, look at the, the service uh, and all the information, uh, uh, the, the research uh, for the, for find the all kind of resources. The second one is uh, the Pukariki that is uh, really different for the first one because uh, it's at the same time an interface that communicates the uh, an archives, a library, museum, uh, a library, a museum, and the touristic information. So there is. Uh, uh, the tourist information that is really important because it's another kind of service that converge in the same interface. Uh, it's made by, um, in, it, it's born in uh, New Zealand. And uh, Pukariki is an innovative uh, museum, library, and information center that combine all kind of resources like uh, knowledge and heritage object for a complete user experience, at a complete uh, visitor experience. And the third one and the last one is uh, uh, Trove, that is the most famous, I think. And it's uh, an archives in, in connection with the, the library and the community. And uh, I think it's really important, the role of the community, because uh, um, they developed uh, this project uh, with the use, with the presence, a strong presence of the community. Trove is a tool a discovery tool focused on the Australia culture and the heritage and history, and contain um, and with the single access point, uh, you can find uh, every kind of information. You can find books, journal, magazine, articles, and uh, uh, so on. Um, as well, these three case studies uh, point to common solutions and uh, a lot of concern because uh, among around collaborative and convergence project because the collaboration across this institution is not easy, uh, sometimes not simple. But uh, uh, as you can notice uh, in all the, the, um, the projects, uh, it's really important providing United uh, access uh, because it is uh, viewed as necessary to meeting uh, the need of the users. And uh, each case, the aim is uh, to break down the silos uh, among libraries, museums, and uh, libraries, and um, archives, sorry, in order to show how the digital interfaces uh, represent on the web what sometimes happens in a convergent uh, physical space. Uh, and for that, for the physical space, uh, I will pass again the, the, the word to Maria that will talk about it. Uh, in a complete way. Thank you. So thank you, Marco. And uh, um, I will uh, speak about the, um, the, the, the physical space and uh, the lamps. Uh, as we have seen, digital interfaces rep uh, represent the new mode of creation, uh, collection, dissemination and access to, uh, to knowledge by contemporary users. Uh, so um, this information became very uh, smoother today, uh, turning into um, a visual labyrinth on the screen and uh, in, is in the, first, the first immediate guidance tool for users um, is made metaphorically by the look. So um, it is very important to uh, um, reflect on the form of these digital uh, spaces but also on the form of the physical uh, spaces of LAM. Um, in fact, uh, observing the physical space, uh, we can understand uh, the relationships between users and uh, documentary resources and users and architectural space. Uh, 
Uh, these reflections are the basis um, of uh, uh, the proposed analysis model that uh, will be applied to the specific case of MAB, Montelupo, Museo Archivio and Biblioteca, um, and uh, in, that, are, uh, that will be applied on this, uh, on this uh, institution uh, in the coming months and that I have already applied um, on other two Italian library, uh, Archimede in Settimo Torinese and Oblate in Florence. And uh, MAB uh, was inaugurated on the 4th of May of 2004 in Montelupo Fiorentino, a small town near Florence. And uh, um, uh, its project has been uh, structured, uh, on a, has been originated from a study commissioned um, by the City Council um, and prepared by a working group composed by Maurizio Vivarelli, Enrica Pagella, Carlotta Margarone and Claudio Rosati. Uh, and with whom has been originated a um, uh, theoretical and uh, uh, original um, common model. Um, in MAB, within the same building, there are, um, there are the um, three spaces, the uh, ceramics museums, uh, the archives and the public library um, on an area of 1,000 um, square meters divided on three stages with a common reception area and the conceptual uh, connection between library, museums and archives um, it, in what way was made evident uh, in the reading rooms um, by the presence of uh, um, ceramics and other bibliographic materials. Uh, so, um, living on the, on the background, uh, the specific case of study, uh, we can uh, concentrate on the main questions of this, uh, of this day. Um, so, uh, what can, uh, how can we investigate the connection between physical and digital space uh, in uh, uh, cultural heritage, in particular in uh, library, archives and museums? We can, um, Mm, we can have, we can say uh, we haven't uh, um, a correct uh, answer, um, but we we think that uh, um, if we uh, conceive these spaces uh, like text, uh, the elements of which uh, um, give rise to a texture of uh, different uh, science, um, with, um, whom uh, whom uh, um, signification um, must be guaranteed by a code, uh, we can try to um, have an overview uh, on the on the um, uh, changes that contemporary society um, have uh, has to um, to this type of institutions. Um, we can uh, have uh, also the ability to uh, know and be able to use uh, different type of uh, existing analysis, existing method analysis like quantitative or qualitative, and try to uh, find the uh, identity of individual institution as complex system. So these reflections uh, are the basis of our um, proposed uh, prospective analysis method. And uh, um, to, uh, we decide to define this approach to the study uh, of spaces, uh, of spaces like, uh, with the term of holistic, because uh, um, throughout it, uh, we think that it's possible to, um, to consider um, in its totality what occurs uh, um, in the uh, an architectural, um, bibliographic and digital space of uh, uh, library, archives and museum spaces. Uh, and um, from this approach um, derives a, a method, an analysis model uh, that is prospective in its aims and that uh, um, I have uh, structured in um, eight phases. Uh, in the first phases, the most important thing is to collect the existing services um, the, uh, and uh, make a survey of the architectural, bibliographical and digi digital space, collecting also user, staff and policy makers uh, perception about the spaces. Um, the, the second part is uh, to create an evaluation grid based on the, um, the above observation and uh, carrying out also other structured observation of some um, significant area uh, of, the, of the institutions. And then, um, and finally, analyze all data with uh, create, creating uh, maps uh, um, based on the visual study, vis visual studies uh, um, theory and uh, um, graphs and, uh, and table. 
uh, we think that uh, applying this uh, type of approach and uh, uh, its model, it's possible to highlight the significant process that will be uh, created in the in uh, physical and digital space of uh, LAM institutions. Um, try to understand how LAM environment influences the uh, the using of these uh, of these spaces by by users and investigate also the psychological and interpretive relationships between users and, and space. Uh, so, um, with this type of, uh, of approach and the model analysis, we think that uh, um, uh, observing the traces uh, live by the users um, in the physical space during their, their stay in, the, in these institutions, um, we can also study uh, the phenomena detected in the digital space of LAM institution, observing the traces that they live, that the users live um, in, uh, in web when they move into these uh, in digital interfaces faces. And so I leave the word to Lorenzo that uh, illustrate us uh, um, what happened in the digital space. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Good morning, everybody. I have uh, maybe 20 slides in less than five minutes because the timing is a <laughs> problem now. So I can go very quickly to the, the first introduction of my, of my contribution. Uh, we try to observe uh, uh, data as a trace, as a sign. Uh, this is the main focus of, uh, of uh, our, our contribution here. As uh, Maria uh, remembered us in the, the introduction, we are living uh, uh, into the complexity. But nowadays, we are also living uh, uh, into the information age. That means that we are surrounded by really a lot of uh, data, digital data. Uh, there is quite, quite amazing the amount of data we every day produce and arch archive and store and so on. Uh, I just give you some very short reference to, to, to understand to the, the size of this, uh, of this, of this uh, phenomena that we are living. Uh, digital information are growing really, really uh, very fast. Um, I don't need now to spend time uh, uh, explaining the, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, phenomena. But uh, it, it is a really a challenge for, for us uh, and it is also an, uh, an opportunity for sure. Uh, we can name it uh, as big data. Big data phenomena is the shift that the scientific and the technological uh, world environment are, um, are trying to make uh, in moving from uh, data analysis, data analysis to big data analysis, where the, the tools and the methods are, um, are growing, are changing to better deal with this kind of uh, size of, uh, and not only size, but also uh, variety and velocity in which uh, uh, data come to us. Uh, so we can see a lot of, a lot of things about this matter, about this subject, but for instance, uh, we have, um, we are observing uh, that the, the, technology, the technology world is uh, providing uh, very fast, very quickly, uh, very fast, sorry, a lot of uh, new instruments, new tools and technology to, to deal with these uh, uh, new scenarios we, we have. Uh, we are in front of, the, of, of us. And uh, this, that provides a uh, great, great uh, opportunity because those data uh, that we have uh, uh, that we have now are in a digital form. That means that the uh, machine can help us, can help us uh, to uh, transform, analyze, and all we hope to transform and extract valuable knowledge and insight from all of them. So this is the, the main uh, task of uh, data analysts and data scientists uh, nowadays. Uh, in this context, uh, we also have uh, uh, the, the rise of an important uh, scientific field, uh, scientific di di discipline uh, that is named uh, network science. Uh, this discipline uh, provides a theoretical foundation, foundation uh, to the analysis of uh, complex system, uh, observing the dynamic of the relationship between agents that populate such systems. It is very important. It is based on the graph theory where, just very, very shortly, uh, where uh, the, mo the mathematical model is uh, 
composed by nodes and edge, the, which can help us to represent the, the reality. Uh, go, go, go very fast. Uh, we can now observe uh, which, uh, which kind of data are produced and stored by uh, LAM, LAM in the digital space. So we have uh, uh, items from the catalog, we have informative uh, content, digital objects, uh, we have information uh, from the audience and the visitors. I have finished the matter. One minute, two minutes, let tell me. I am just, uh, I'm just arriving. But, <clears throat> So, uh, we have a lot of information that we can uh, find in the environment of, uh, of the uh, library archives and a museum. And we can model this kind of, of information using the graph data model, where every node can be used to represent uh, item, author, subject, concept, users, user interaction, comments, uh, everything. Uh, in uh, our holistic approach, we, we are trying to consider all this information together. And so we can have, for instance, a graph model made with the information coming from the convergence of the, uh, um, the digital space from every single institution. And we can see uh, how uh, this data can be uh, related together and start some uh, proper analysis on, uh, on, on, on them. For instance, we can show and um, analyze and, and, uh, and, sorry, and focus on which are the more central nodes in the dynamic of the relationship in the network, in the resulting network. And we can also find patterns and hidden relationships that are not uh, obvious or explicit in, in, in the data itself, but, but we, that we can uh, find out using this analysis. Uh, we are just spending the first 20 minutes uh, in, for, from our presentation, so we are not out of time right now. Um, this anal data analysis model uh, let us to express data itself in their complexity and entirety, not just as an aggregation for an aggregated form. We are also able to reflect the variety of the digital, digital asset typical for the convergence of these uh, different institutions, uh, and so that we can derive uh, concrete opportunity uh, to make informed decision, understand the relationship, let people to use better the space uh, and the content of these institutions. Uh, I go to the conclusions just to just to say that our next step is to apply uh, those approach or those principles in the MAB experience. Uh, we will start in September uh, collecting data from the MAB. Uh, and then uh, we will try to address the need to define a frame of interpretation systematic and integrated from all these different kind of space we are going to analyze. And we think that uh, in the, using this kind of hope approach, we can read the signs and traces in the physical and digital spaces as a specific identity of the institution we are going to analyze. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will have time for a very short question. I, uh, I'd like to repeat. I asked, uh, I asked uh, what are the objectives of this um, uh, research? Okay. Uh, the objective should be, would be to try to uh, address the needs to identify uh, a model of analysis to provide some um, tools that help people to uh, uh, better understand the dynamic of the convergence. Just not only consider uh, a single aspect, but to have a, a complete view of every aspect that uh, uh, happen in, uh, in, the, in the path to the convergence uh, by providing a formal frame of investigation. This is my point of view. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, I had a... Oh. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we hope to have some time in the end. So I guess we have to wait till then. Um, thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation about LAM in reality. Uh, we will now move to the next paper, which is presented by Maria Luisa Russo and Timothy Leonardo. 
Maria Luisa Russo is a specialist in preservation, conservation, and valorization of library and archive materials. And Timothy Leonardo um, is curator of manuscripts of, uh, and rare books. They are both project managers uh, of a project on book bindings at the University of Turin. And this is also one of the subjects of the paper. The paper is called Managing Cultural Heritage Beyond Professional Boundaries, Problem or Opportunity. The floor is yours. So, thank you. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you to the organizers for this very interesting satellite meeting. Uh, in this presentation, my colleague Timothy Leonardi and I will show examples of projects in which the integration among different professional fields has been a real opportunity rather than a problem. As we all know, the management, care and preservation of the various types of cultural artifacts, books, documents, works of art, have been historically marked by boundaries which have become the limitations among the professionals of various fields. A more comprehensive approach to cultural artifacts in their complexity and historical life and to the role they play in memory institutions shows that collections can be managed more effectively through the integration of various professional fields. First of all, first of all, nothing, <laughs> okay. Um, a brief summary about professional boundaries, which are linked, uh, first of all, to the way of interpreting the characteristics of items. So we have the separation between written cultural heritage and works of art. The presence of the component text has marked the path of access, use, and preservation of books and documents. The aspect of readability has influenced the preservation and conservation policies in archives and libraries paying much more attention to content access and mechanical functionality than to the preservation of physical integrity of items in their original characteristics. But even if libraries and archives have this important element in common, another professional boundary appears at a more in-depth view, the difference between book and document. I will just remind here the concept of archival bond which is traditionally recognized to documents but not to books by stating that each item in a library is autonomous and it is the product of the will of collecting, while spontaneity is the other characteristic of archival aggregations. Beyond the theoretical formulations, there are several signs around us of different points of view. Uh, Mark Rubicki has already mentioned uh, a number of them. I will mention other ones. And at an international level, a meaningful example is the UNESCO project Memory of the World. In 2002, the guidelines of the project proposed a cross-disciplinary view on cultural heritage and expressed the will of portion objectives without being delimited by institutional typologies or professions. Then we can mention experiences in the framework of the so-called Case Museo in Italy, and again in a wider context, the BAM, the Germany Joint Portal for Libraries, Archives and Museums, um, of the Bibliothek Service Zentrum Baden-Württemberg. And you can see here the homepage of this uh, website. All these experiences show how knowledge can be improved and facilitated by linking sources together. Recent research is critically revising the distinction between library and archives, also because curators have to deal more and more often with hybrid collections. In order to show this aspect, it is useful to consider unconventional fonts, issues and challenges created by what is not traditionally taken into consideration in theoretical elaborations. Personal fonts are one of these issues. These fonts, or documentary complexes, normally include documents, books, and objects owned by an individual. We have to take into account the fact that in the mentality of the individual, there was probably no clear distinction between library and archive, and that if we adopt such a rigid categorization today, we certainly risk depriving our collections of one of their most important characteristics. So we have to pose ourselves some questions. First of all, 
Is the hierarchical rearrangement suitable, suitable in these kinds of archives? And second, is the distinction between library and archive useful for the user? From this point of view, I will briefly pre present you the Pau Kale fonts, which is preserved in the University of Turin. It was the scientific uh, archive and library of the German Orientalist Paul Ernst Kale, uh, acquired by the University of Turin for its relevance in the field of Oriental studies. This font appears to be the true laboratory of the intellectual. Papers, books, notes, loose leaves represent a whole documentary complex which was used, used by the individual for study and research. And you can see books, more or less, uh, more or less conventional documents, objects like the typewriter machine, documents preserved inside books, and uh, printed books with added sheets with uh, uh, handwritten notes on it. So this is a real hybrid collection. And thanks to a project specifically devoted to these funds, funded, uh, the project uh, um, is the Cadmos project funded by Regione Piemonte, it has been possible to describe, inventory, and rearrange the archive. The software Collective Access has been used. It is an open source software. And the traditional hierarchical structure, uh, typical for archival rearrangements, have been, has been combined with a full text search that can help find in different sources. A special section is dedicated to noted books and to documents preserved inside books, highlighting the relationships among the various items. And here you see, for example, the hierarchical structure that has been given to the, to the archive with uh, the division into series, sub-series, and so on. Full text search, in our case with Arabic and Hebrew keyboards because of the specific contents of the archive. And a sample of an entry where you can see here related objects. Uh, the user can jump from a source to the other by following the links. So uh, the, users, the user can find a source he is interested in, but without being led by documentary typologies. And um, coming to the second issue I posed, the distinction between the book and the museum artifact. Books show an interesting overlapping with museum artifacts due to the presence of material characteristics whose interest certainly goes beyond the text, like book bindings, as you see here. As we all know, the predominance of text in books has determined very radical choices, for example, in preservation and conservation. Ephemera like lean paper bindings of the 18th century onwards have often been discarded in order to build more solid bindings which did not respect at all the physical original structure of items. The consideration of the physical characteristics of books leads to other choices. I am currently involved, together with my colleague Timothy Leinardi, as project manager of the project Sigec Legature, on the valorization of book bindings in their physical and historical value. The project is funded by Regione Piemonte and Centro Studi Piemontesi, and the premise of the project is the printed collection by Francesco Malaguzzi, De Libris Compactis, a collection of printed books on the most valuable uh, book bindings preserved in Piedmont. The aim of the current project is to create a database of, the book, of book bindings uh, pre uh, preserved in Piedmont by both uploading uh, the book bindings described in the printed books, uh, revised and with a greater quantity and variety of information, and widening the study to include book bindings which had not yet been taken into consideration. The software used for bindings description is CJEC Web, a software created by the Ministry of Cultural Heritage. This software was studied for works of art, and thanks to this project, it is being used for the very first time to describe book bindings. This has required an intensive preliminary work of model ad adaptation to adapt the model form to the description of book bindings. Data have been organized into uniform standard description and photographic documentation has been added for each book bindings. 
Unfortunately, this database is not yet accessible for users on web, but we hope it will be soon. We are still working at the project currently, and this stage, it, it is still a work in progress. So, coming to the conclusion of this first part of the talk. The debate regarding the duality of books as text and material object has led to relevant changes in the approach to book preservation and conservation. Nevertheless, it is difficult to reach an equilibrium due to the predominant function given to books as tools for study and research. As a food for thought provocative, I will conclude my, talk, my part of talk with a quotation from Nicholas Pickwood, outstanding book conservator and scholar. There will need to be a radical change in attitude towards books, a move away from the library where they are seen as tools to be read, towards the museum where they are seen as historic artifacts whose preservation must include the materials from which they are made. This affirmation is no doubt provocative, but it clearly points out the need of synergic management of cultural heritage and should help us in the critical reflection about our professional approach. Now I give the floor to my colleague Timothy Leonardi, who will present other aspects of professional integration. Thank you, Maria Luisa. Uh, bye. Uh, I'm curator of manuscript and real books at the Capitulari Library of Vercelli and the museum manager of the Cathedral Treasure Museum that is placed near uh, the library. Today I would like to show you two topics related to my perspective of the progressive convergence among the libraries, archives, and museums. In other words, how I deleted the professional boundaries in my daily job in Vercelli to make possible the interoperability between several experts and to create a working interdisciplinary environment with colleagues curators, paleographers, historians and art historians, scholars, students, image specialists, and chemical scientists. The Cathedral Treasure Museum, the library, and the archives are part of the Fondazione Museo del Tesoro del Duomo e Archivio Capitolari, an ecclesiastic institution which has the goal to preserving and valorizing the work of arts, manuscripts, early printed books, and documentary evidences of the Archdiocese of Vercelli and the Cathedral Chapter of Vercelli. Between its treasure, a very important field of research is dedicated to the collection of reliquaries, of medieval reliquaries. This assortment is one of the most important collection of sacred goldsmiths art in northern Italy, belonging to the period between 7th and 18th century. Research about this item takes great advantage of literary resources preserved in the Capitulari Library and Archives of Vercelli as parchments, documents, manuscripts, and books. In this case, the various sources can be connected and made accessible to scholars and researchers by means of the cross-disciplinary skills of the foundation staff, constituted by a curator librarian, an archivist, and two art historians. Just to mention an example about the integration among different professional fields uh, has been a real opportunity is a research that my colleague Sara Minelli showed at the International Congress on Medieval Studies in Kalamazoo, Michigan and in Leeds this year. The architectural reliquary of the Holy Virgin, St. Catherine, St. Barnabas, and a choral which was donated to the cathedral by Martino de Bulgaro in 1350 here are the documentary relevances. Martino was an archdiacon in the Vercelli Cathedral that donated not only the choral, but also a manuscript, a Liber Decretaris, now preserved in the Capitulary Library with the shelf mark 5. The choral is dated back to the 1350 because in the Capitulary Archives is also preserved the parchment with the bequest by Martino where is cited it. This last news is also reported in the manuscript 5 in a partially deleted inscription by Martino. Finally, the choral is described in the Inventarium Scripturarum Existentium in Archivio Sancti Eusebi Vercellensis, dated 1426 and written by Canon Giovanni de Guidalardis, now in the Capitulari Archives. 
the same list also mentions the architectural structure in which the coral is located today, which means that the objects were joined together after 1426. The inventory gives us an overall view of the canon's possession by describing their richness and variety and provides us with important data for a more in-depth study of reliquaries, which are mentioned in the inventory in great detail. As I showed you before, this list supplies the scholar with important information regarding the two objects, the architectural structure and the coral, which are today a single metalwork. Now, the reliquary is preserved in the museum, but until 1998 it was in the cathedral, with other reliquaries inside the altar of relics. I'm just going to show you my second and last topic that is related to some analysis of treasures preserved in the Capitulary Library. Up to now, uh, usually the area that has become known as digital humanities has been focused primarily on large scale digitization project of historical manuscripts and printed documents. The goal of these projects is typically to reproduce the visual appearance of the text and sometimes to approximate the experience of reading the actual document. At the Capitulary Library, instead, in 2013 and 2014, the Lazarus Project explored a complementary path to these efforts by taking advantage of the recent advance of imaging multispectral technology. New tools for illumination, new lenses, new sensors, computing hardware, and algorithms for image processing now allow imagery to be generated from text that have been damaged or erased, including palimpsests and documents that have been charred by fire, faded to invisibility, stained or washed by water. More importantly, those few multispectral labs in existence, about five around the world, are proprietary and are not transportable, but the lab owned by the Lazarus Project, however, was designed specifically to be transportable. The team of the Lazarus Project, established some years ago at the University of Mississippi by Gregory Ewerf, Associate Professor of English, Ken Boyston, CEO of Megavision Santa Barbara, California, Roger Easton, Professor of Imaging Science at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and Michael Phelps, Executive Director of Early Manuscript Electronic Library, spent totally four weeks in Vercelli to analyze several manuscripts Panemistas and scrolls. This is a work in progress because the data re-elaboration is very, very long. Now, spring 2013. Uh, the staff, a range of experts and trained students, imaged the Vercelli book, the Mappamundi, and several palimpsests dated back to 9 and 10 centuries. The Vercelli book, one of the four oldest manuscripts of old English in existence, contains homilies in prose and verse in Anglo-Saxon language. Defaced by a German scholar in the, uh, in the 18th century, using a chemical reagent, the manuscript is married by dark brown bloats where the reagent was applied to the text. The conjunction of transmissive lights from below, multispectral lights from above, working lights and multi filters has enabled us to produce images that have improved legibility. At the same time, the 12th century Vercelli Mappamundi is being imaged multispectrally and transmissively. The Vercelli map had suffered serious fading aggravated in an attempt to restore it during the second half of the 20th century. The combination of the transmissive and UV block filter proved particularly effective restoring most of the map to complete legibility. Summer 2014, the Codex Vercellensis Evangeliorum, also known as Manuscript A, written in the half of the 4th century, traditionally by Bishop Eusebio in Vercelli. The manuscript contains a Vetus Latina, a translation of the four canonical gospels from Greek, and it is the first translation known prior to the vul popular Vulgata by St. Jerome, dated back to 382. The Eusebius manuscript is used for religious ceremonies until the early Middle Ages, and then it becomes object of devotion. 
Moreover, the wear and the deterioration of the pages is due to the continuous and intense adoration, as well as to the use of laying hands on the manuscript in solemn oath. The manuscript is unbound because the binding, dated 10th century, is preserved separately in the Museum of Vercelli to make possible the study of both. This year, during the second week of analysis in Vercelli, Ira Rabin and his team from the German Federal Institute for Material Research and Testing in Berlin investigated manuscripts with the same not invasive technology used to study the ink of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In particular, they studied inks from the Vercelli book, the manuscript A, and another manuscript of Vercelli known as Leges Langobardorum, dated back to 9th century. I finished. Examples of personal fonts and mixed collection where objects and works of art are closely related to books and documents show that a critical rethinking is required concerning professional boundaries. The fact that it is necessary to organize the information for practical reasons should not become an obstacle for users. Since our final goal is to preserve our cultural heritage and provide access to it. We must find the most effective ways to achieve both goals in respect of the characteristic of the items and of users' needs. The management of cultural heritage and its access in memo institutions take great advantage of the interaction and integration of various competencies and skills, and of innovative experiences aimed at making our collection available to an international scientific community. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, one very short question. Now two. Anyone? Yeah? Please? And my name is Alfonso Sgambato. I'm an archivist, uh, recently graduated in Genoa. Uh, I had a question for you, uh, Maria Luisa, because I was interested in a picture you showed about the Cale Fund, in which documents can be found inside books. How did you treat them? Did you preserve the physical link or did you extract them and just mention uh, where they were located originally and why did you opt for one way or the other? Mm -hmm. Just a moment. I'll just... You mean this one? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, it, we often, often have to deal with documents whose uh, content is closely related with the topic of the book. This is a typical case because uh, uh, these are study notes related to the content of the books. So, um, um, related with the content of this book. So, um, the users uh, need to see the document and the book together. So we chose to keep those documents inside the books, because uh, right because there was this link, and uh, we have marked the book with a strip of uh, paper for um, preservation, preservation paper. And as for the description, this was the solution adopted, this one. You see the title of the document, a letter from uh, Kale to another person. Here you see the shelf mark of the book inside which the document is preserved. So the user can, uh, is interested, of course, not in the shelf mark, but in the document. So uh, the user looks for the document, and we know that that document is preserved inside that book, whose title is reported here, and then the related objects that can lead the user to other sources. Thank you. Uh, I think we have to have further questions later on after the <coughs> last presentation. It was a little uh, late after this coffee break, so we have some time challenges. <coughs> and thank you for you too. Uh, our last presenter uh, is only present by Digital Aids. 
He's uh, called Isto Uhuvila. Uh, he could not be here in person, so he filmed his Business presentation. And his contribution. The University in Finland and at the Department of Archival Library. Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, Isto Uhuvila is a senior lecturer in information management and is affiliated both with Åbo Academy in Finland and Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, we will try to have him present for questions uh, via Adobe Connect afterwards. And please, the canvas is yours, as yeah. it say. Yeah, you started? For Info Information, Museum and Cultural Heritage Studies at Uppsala University in Sweden. I have conducted that. extensive empirical research on libraries, archives and museums and how the professionals are working and how they are conceptualizing the role and the different aspects of their institutions at the present and in the future. Today I'm going to discuss about the convergence of technology and the real stuff and the making of the digital and non-digital in archives, libraries and museums. A kind of a starting point of the discussion is that the digital technologies are there and they are a game changer, period. Uh, that's a kind of a fact, as long as there are any facts in the contemporary society. Different museums have adopted digital technologies as part of their exhibitions in the museum uh, halls and as a part of the virtual or digital presence on the World Wide Web and in the different kinds of digital devices. Uh, the digital technologies are part of the archival world today. Most of the documents produced today, they might not have a paper-based, a printed uh, version of it existing anymore, but the documents are just digital and they don't exist in, in paper-based formats. And libraries and reading and the activities related to, to reading and, and, and information retrieval, they are activities that have been digitalized in a fast pace. Partly it's a question of, of tablets and part of the question of, of digital books that you can take with you and you can interact with them in, in different ways than you can interact with, with ordinary printed books. But even more so, it's a question of how we interact with information. In the olden days, uh, we, when we had a question, we checked the encyclopedia or we asked the mum. Okay, we're still asking mum that hasn't disappeared. Or when we didn't have a book, we went to a library and tried to find a, an appropriate book in the library to, to find an answer to the question, to our information needs. At the moment, we are using this. We are searching for very many different kinds of things in our everyday life information needs, both at work and, and both outside the workplace. This doesn't obviously mean that the printed book would disappear kind of tomorrow or that there wouldn't be any, any affordances, any positive aspects with the digital artifacts we have been using quite a long time. It doesn't mean that the works of art could be easily digitalized, the cultural heritage artifacts could be easily digitalized in a way that uh, the original physical objects would lose their significance. The fact that digital technologies are a game changer, it's a question of, of some kind of a convergence, whether described in Jenkinsian way or in, in some other sense. But it's a question that the digital world and the kind of the physically based world, they are colliding, they are converging in, in different ways. And that's something I would keep as a kind of a fact. It's it's there and it's it's an obvious matter that doesn't need to be discussed per se. But then there is an interesting question that we don't know too well, or we do have very many different kinds of ideas or assumptions about, and it's the question of how digital technology is part of the libraries, archives and museums. How digital technology is influencing what kind of an impact it has on these institutions. I have conducted and been, been part of, of a range of studies uh, on the different aspects of the digitization of cultural heritage institutions. And there are some trends that are common to the studies uh, that 
have uh, significance for, from the convergence of technology and the real stuff point of view. As a part of the a library 2.0, a new participatory context uh, project uh, financed by the Academy of Finland for some years ago, uh, we conducted a series of studies about, about what library 2.0 is, the kind of the, the buzzword and, and the phenomenon of that day. Uh, and we tried to frame what it means and when, what's kind of behind, wh why it does exist. And as a part of the work of defining Library 2.0, we conducted a covert analysis of, of the uh, writings of, of a bunch of Finnish librarians about, about what kind of what they understood that Library 2.0 is and what they felt about it. And there were some themes that 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 could be identified in in the analysis. And there were the kind of the very library related stuff about libraries and library services. And there were a whole lot of different kinds of social aspects and soft values integrated in the things. But then there were clusters about web and the participatory web and about the technology and tools. And even if they were integrated with the other things, they were kind of clearly separate clusters and you could identify them as entities in, in the co-word map. In another study of of the Swedish uh, library archives and museum professionals, uh, I did a survey about uh, how the professionals felt about the presence and the future and the aspects and the role of technology in, in their work and at their institutions. And uh, as a part of a survey of, of how they perceived technology as uh, as a kind of constituent, as a and as a part of the institutions, there could, there were some themes that could be identified in the in the survey record. There was there was a tendency to see an intrinsic value in the technology, and uh, there was also a sort of techno enthusiasm that the kind of the technology is the driver that's that's kind of come, taking the change to the institutions. Then there was also that technology was an enable. It, it was an enabler of, of some things, mainly of, of cooperation, that the cooperation kind of came first and the technology came then. But it's still quite obvious that the idea of technology, it, it was a very technology-oriented and the aspect of kind of how it could be integrated into the, to the space of the institutions, it was there, but it wasn't kind of very, very well, well kind of highlighted by, by the study. I'll, as a part of the same same broader study, uh, where also the professionals were also asked about the future of, of the uh, libraries, archives, and museums, and there were a, were a number of themes that emerged from the data. But there was also clearly the same tendency of kind of that technology stood out. Most obviously, it stood out in the theme number two that the service quality and the use of technology are are kind of strongly coupled. If we take the technology, and we have to take the technology in order to provide better quality service. It was also present in the other themes, for instance, in the first one, the externalization of change, where the professionals were quite obviously seeing many of the things that are kind of drivers of the change as something that comes out, out of the institution from the society. And for instance, the technology was one of the things that was perceived to be external to the institutions and that the technology comes and we have to deal with it somehow. Further on, in the study of, of archival professionals, uh, how they saw the different uh, drivers of value in their work, what kind of, what's important for, for the archival what work, what's the what the different kinds of reg regimes of work are influencing the, the work of archives. Uh, there were some themes uh, identified in the study uh, that will be published later this year in the journal article that will say in the end of 2014. And there was also, there were different archival theoretical aspects that the archives have value for the organizations that are originating the information and so on. But there was also a clearly uh, separate digital idea that the digital has its own regime, its own 
kind of constellation of worth from the archival point of view, that the digital has to be tackled as, as a kind of a separate entity, and it, it, it's kind of there, not totally integrated into everything else. And as a general observation of these different studies, you could say that there is a rather strong trend to conceptualize technology as an isolated entity, and as a kind of an uh, constructed quote, then kind of we have this situation and then, then we take the technology and then something happens. It's close to magic and kind of close to black boxing the technology as something that it's, it's a kind of a tool that we take. It's kind of an, if it's a utopian thing, uh, thing so then we see that it, it's going to solve all our problems. If we, if we or if the professionals take a more kind of dystopian attitude, so then the kind of the box comes and then it kind of destroys everything or it's kind of really, really sinister thing. And uh, in a way, this extends also to how the role of the different professionals is, is being perceived. And in addition to taking the technology in the institution, there's also kind of this, uh, this kind of an attitude or tendency to, to kind of take people in a similar terms. That we, if we have a certain situation at, at the institutions, if the professionals see that there is something is needed, we, if we have to do something with the digital technology. So the solution is to kind of take the technology man in, in, the, in the institution and to fix the, fix the thing or to see that there are technology people outside of their own institution doing things with, uh, with the things that are obvious interest for libraries, archives and museums, but they are still kind of doing their own things there and, and, we're, and, and it's, it's a bit uneasy relation, but, but it's, it's not kind of properly solved anyway. They are kind of in their own domain, even if they are working with things that should be having some relevance for, for the LAMs. And the question is actually whether kind of we can say that the technology man, whether it's taken into the institution or so seen other, in other places in the society, whether it's actually a question of that they are technology men or technology people, technology women. And my argument on the basis of, of the analysis of, of this data and, and the results of these studies is that the technology men, they are kind of actually content men. They are kind of subject matter men. They are subject matter people. They, by applying the technology at the institution or outside of the institution, uh, dealing with library, archives, and museums-related matters, so they are actually defining uh, what libraries, archives, and museums are. They are defining what is cultural heritage, how cultural heritage is being preserved, uh, how their services are being developed. And in, 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 a more, bro in more broader terms, uh, I would say that all technology jobs, they are conceptual jobs, they are subject matter jobs. And I would say that from the point of view of the institutions, uh, this kind of dichotomy might be rather dangerous or at least difficult uh, in a sense that by dichotomizing technology and the institutions, uh, either explicitly or more so in, an, in implicit terms, it, uh, it's problematic because it takes part of the kind of the control of, of the possibility to influence, to possib the possibility to be uh, in uh, defining, in developing, in, in having a say, in, in kind of making the, the, the things that are libraries, that are archives, that are museums, and that have been for a long time developed and has been seen as, as kind of fundamental aspects of, of these kinds of services. Why libraries exist, why archives ex exist, why museums exist. And if the librarians, archivists, and museum professionals aren't kind of doing the technology things or aren't kind of discussing very actively with the technology people that, that kind of what's the essential aspect of the things that should be done, or what, what, what kind of what, what the professionals know that that might be useful, what the professionals know that that should be taken into account. Uh, so they they are easily forgotten. 
if the technology people comes from outside and they don't have this kind of experience and they don't have these kinds of uh, perspectives, so they, they might be lost. And the whole whole kind of this this type of service in the society, it might be suddenly outsourced or suddenly moved to, to somewhere else. I'm not saying that some things couldn't be moved outside of the institutions and so, some things couldn't be redefined as, as kind of... Uh, the domain of, of somebody else, but uh, from the perspective of libraries, archives, and museums, and the, from the perspective of the, of the work that is being done at the at, at these institutions, it would be very important to be participating in the discussion and making a kind of an explicit decision of, of letting something out and, and letting something in. Questions for Isto? Is it? Oh, he's not up here. Yeah, he will hear us anyway. Anyone? Yes, please. Um, I had a question about your um, statement that. The, um, I, I believe this came from your research, that digitization was separate and isolated from the actual museum, archive, and library. Is that correct? You had a, a slide with a great big digital uh, form as a separate entity. Is that correct? Could you explain that a little bit more, how, how you see it or how those who were in your research saw it as a completely, completely separate entity. I suggest you, you do your name. You give your name. Yes, um, this is Patricia Montiel overall from, I'm representing Elise. Yes, please, Sisto. Okay, uh, if I heard the question quite correctly, it's a little bit kind of an echo in the air there. Okay. But um, the, the point I was making uh, is that uh, when uh, cultural heritage or LAM professionals are discussing about the future or the present challenges of their institutions, there, there is, in, in many of those uh, kind of arguments, there is kind of this kind of an idea that the institution is being seen as a kind of one domain, and then the technology is uh, it's somehow separate, and it they, they don't necessarily they do link, and there are good examples of how how kind of a, an institution or an organization has been digitalized, kind of brought into the digital domain, or or kind of in in other ways uh, define the relation of the institution and the technology in a in a more kind of an integrative way, but. Uh, there is a plenty of examples of these kinds of uh, arguments that kind of we do have this institution here, and then we take the technology, we take this information system, and then it's going to do things. It's going to bring us more interaction with the with the visitors or, or the stakeholders of the of the institution, or then it's it's going to solve our problems of preservation or something else. And uh, this doesn't kind of really these kinds of arguments don't really kind of explain or they don't seem to to take into account the the, the kind of the, 
the necessity to actually apply the technology in the organization and, and to see it as more like an organizational change process rather than as a, as a kind of, of taking a tool and, and doing something like you can do with a hammer. Another question? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, Isto. It's Tatiana from Zadar. Yeah. Hello. Sorry, you, you are not, not here with us. Uh, I'm very interested in knowing uh, at your new at your department of uh, archival libraries and museum studies uh, what did you choose to have as a common courses or core courses which can bound all three disciplines together um. I'm actually kind of I'm representing the archives libraries and museums department in, in Uppsala where we don't have uh, two integrated program. We do have a common uh, introductory course, and then we do have a, a common course uh, for the master's thesis and for theory and method. And then we do have uh, basically separate curriculum for the different students uh, or, or the different kind of lines of students uh, with. Uh, a bunch of common lectures, for instance, about knowledge organization and uh, and communication with users and so on. But it's more like that there are common lectures and, and common seminars that are part of, uh, at the same time, they are part of different courses. Uh, so that's kind of, in, in a way, half integrated. Then I've been also involved in, in the department in, in Lund in southern Sweden, and, and the curriculum there, it's, it's much more integrated in a way that there are three uh, specialist courses for the for the uh, for the different a l and m and uh, things like of course introduction and theory and method and so on but also uh, uh, communication uh, uh, knowledge organization project management uh, stuff like this uh, so they are they are kind of uh, courses that are are common for for everyone, and then there are, let's say, the no, of course, in knowledge organization, it's a, it's a good example that it's it's kind of there is a common uh, theoretical and and practical introduction about half of the course for all, all of the all of the different uh, all of the students, and then uh, in the end, there is a kind of specialization where uh, where archival student archival science students get to to know more in detail how, how knowledge is organized in archives and, and, and for library students there is cataloging and, and for museum students there is there is museum cataloging. Thank you to Isto sitting in Uppsala, is it? Yeah. Um, we have to have some lunch now, I think. Thank you so much for coming to this session. And thank you, Easter, for participating. And you can't have the lunch. I'm sorry. Yeah.